Thank you for being here for the last keynote of this uh, first edition of the XARC Symposium. We are drawing now to an end. Uh, I will make more remarks at the end of it, but uh, I would like to thank immediately our um, keynote speakers, Arturo, Charles, Florian, and now Neil Leach, who will uh, take us to the last keynote with uh, Alien Intelligence AI Creativity. Okay. So I will. Uh, I don't think that Neil Leach has to be really presented. He's an architect, a theorist, uh, a globetrotter, by the way. So you can find a lot of his uh, thoughts and lectures all over the internet, but we want to have him uh, live today. So thanks a lot. And please, you can start. Thank you, um, Marit. Um, I... Uh... I had been expecting to hear a lot of Scouse voices when coming to the Liverpool University. Um, but I think apart from John, there's no one British here, which means I think maybe the name of this university should be the University of Livorno rather than uh, Liverpool. Um, uh, but maybe I can just um, sketch out my position, first of all, in terms of AI. Uh, 2019, I was working on a book um, for uh, Bloomsbury, the Harry Potter publishers um, about AI, and I um, I kind of felt a little difficult. I felt, I felt compromised. I felt like like Elon Musk, and you know, I was working with AI, but also kind of disturbed by AI. Um, and there's a little little bit of this in this lecture. Um, so what I did manage to do was to persuade Bloomsbury to produce two different books: one with a white cover, like the Angel, um, and one with a black cover, um, like um, the Devil. Um, and that the the dark the black cover one the black mirror episode has yet to come out and I was hoping to push it back a few months years even, but it seems like we're in a sort of slightly dystopian world at the moment so there's going to be a little bit of dystopia in this thing um, and I haven't written the black book yet but let me just simply say some of you might be curious because I started off my first book was a translation of Alberti from from Latin into English um, and now I'm working on AI um, and um, all I know about the final book, because Alberti was the one who gave us the definition of the architect, of the person in charge, and so on and so on, very optimistic. And now we're in a situation, I think, where we're already compromised in some senses. We've already lost the kind of the the the, the privileged position that the architects used to have. Um, and my view is that AI is going to finish off architecture in some ways. So I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but I all I know is the final sentence in the black book. Um, which is to say that you know uh, uh, the profession of architecture was launched by Alberti in 1450 or so, and it'll probably come to a kind of end um, with AI. And by a curious coincidence, the name Alberti begins in A and ends in I. So there is a connection between Alberti and AI. Um, so I, I want, and I want, I'm just showing you some of these images, mid-journey stuff that uh, Arturo has much better images than me. But I think you know what I want to try and suggest that actually we get, we need to go way beyond these images to really understand um, the potential of AI. And we need to look at the kind of the systems, GPT and so on, that lie behind them. What I also want to do in a very, very provocative way today is to um, question in some senses uh, to what extent, um, well, I'm going to ask whether AI can be creative. And I don't want to say too much right now. Uh, and then whether humans indeed can be also can be said to be creative. And I think one of the things, interesting things I find about AI is the extent to which it can be perceived as a mirror in which we can understand our own condition. Now, we can't make direct comparisons because both the human brain and AI are both, well, neural networks are certainly black boxes. So you can't really come to any conclusive argument, but nonetheless, you can kind of speculate. And over and over again, um, I come to the conclusion that really AI is able to offer us insights into how the human mind operates. Um, and I want to use today to try and question uh, the notion of, of, uh, of human creativity. Um, so maybe I can just flick through these a bit quick, more quickly. Um, um, This is Suja, apparently, according to the mid journey. I haven't been to the canals yet, but anyway. Um, so today I want to um, divide up my 
talk into four separate sections. Um, uh, just briefly to kind of say, to, to run through how AI generates images, we've had some touch, I mean, uh, uh, Toro kind of touched on that in some way. Um, and I want to ask really whether AI is, can be considered creative. Um, and then more provocatively, are human beings actually creative? And finally, in a very dystopian end, um, should we panic? Um, <laughs> so, um, and there's something, there's a lot of, I'm, I'm not, I'm not British, but there's a lot of British stuff in here for some reason. Um, and you'll see, because um, you probably know from Hitchhiker's Guide, that's a, don't panic is part of that. But anyway, so how, how does AI generate images? Um, um, Alan Turing was born 50 miles from Liverpool, just to make him can wave the flag of Liverpool, okay? Um, he was the first person to conceptualize the possibility of, of computing and intelligence um, in a paper published in 1950, but he died in 1954 before the term itself had been coined. And it was coined for a, um, a, a workshop in um, Dartmouth College. Um, and uh, uh, it was coined by, hold on a second, this guy, John McCarthy. Here you can see, you know, all the, the young, the, the smartest young guys at the time, and there's Marvin Minsky there, Claude Shannon is there and so on, got together with an idea, the idea of within two years of trying to solve all the basic problems of AI. Um, it was very kind of, there's a lot of hype about it, what it could do. And it proved to be, they were ill-founded, shall we say. And 50 years later, when the survivors got together um, in 2006 to, um, uh, to, to, to talk about what they achieved, they, they basically concluded they'd achieved nothing and they were probably unlikely to achieve anything in the future. Um, just to say, John McCarthy, the guy here, he coined the term artificial intelligence. Uh, he said he wasn't very happy with the term, um, uh, but he had to call it something. Um, and certainly it's not artificial, it's synthetic perhaps. And as for intelligence, there's a real danger of anthropomorphizing the term. So it's a difficult term in itself. Anyway, um, by a curious coincidence though, 2006 was roughly the time when um, the deep learning revolution began to take 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 uh, take uh, get going, and it was largely due to this guy Jeffrey Hinton, also from the UK, great great grandson of, of George Boole of Boolean geometry fame, he actually studied architecture for two days at the University of Cambridge, and he told me he worked in an office um, the summer before and decided it wasn't for him. So I suspect it took, took, took him two days to work out how he could transfer to natural sciences, which is what he did. And then he did a PhD at the University of Edinburgh before coming to over to the States, to to to, 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 to North America, to Toronto, where um, uh, he uh, set up a very important center for, for AI. Now, Jeffrey Hinton was, was um, in the first 50 years, one of the reasons why AI didn't get, didn't get anywhere was the fact that um, neural networks were very much out of favor, referred to as connectionism. And uh, the different approaches, there were many different approaches, but the symbolic AI, which is based on logic, was the one that um, was dominant. And, and Marvin Minsky had actually co-authored a book with Samuel Papert, where they basically said neural networks were, were going nowhere, forget them. Uh, and Jeffrey Hinton, who was had a had background in 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 the kind of neuroscience, much like Demis Usabis um, of Deep Mind, really believed in the possibility that we're going to get anywhere in AI. We had to model AI on the brain. So he was pursuing neural networks, but it was almost impossible for him to publish anything unless he scrubbed any reference to neural networks from any paper he published. But he kept going. He kept going. And around around 1999, when um, when GPUs began to, they realized how useful they could be uh, for making computers much more powerful and much more quickly, much more quick. Um, eventually, they started to work. And uh, uh, um, so, but so by curious, curious coincidence, 2006 was roughly the time also that we had the the deep learning revolution when all of a sudden people began to realize um, what deep what how useful deep learning is. So just for those who don't really know much too much of this, deep learning is a subset of machine learning. It's a subset of uh, uh, artificial intelligence. Um, it's still called AI these days. When we refer to AI, when we refer to to, to ChatGPT, to Midjourney, and so on, we're talking about deep learning neural networks. Um, Think of them like uh, Russian dolls nested inside each other. Um, and anyway, in 2012, from an architectural perspective, this was a very crucial moment um, because Jeffrey Hinton's team entered this ImageNet competition, which was to see how quickly and effectively you could um, uh, uh, recognize an image. Um, and we take this for granted, and we all have facial recognition on our phones these days. But in 2012, this was a real, real advance. And, and what they basically discovered is that, is that neural networks were, 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 it won this competition hands down. And this was the point where people began to think, okay, 
maybe we should take neural networks seriously. So from 2012 onwards, um, it began to be very um, dominant. So what you've got are these, I mean, these are the neurons, these are the synapses, and the flow of information here is going from left to right and governed by the, the weights on, on the synapses. And, and then there's a process called back propagation, which Jeffrey Hinton invented, which basically um, allows the weights to adjust themselves. So eventually you approximate towards an answer, which is never 100%, it's like 99%, but the word bird um, comes out. But the holy grail really for, for uh, computer science was not um, uh, recognizing images, but hallucinating or gen generating or synthesizing, um, as, it's, as it's put, um, an image. And they actually recognized that if you could invert the network or reverse the flow, instead of going from left to right, go from right to left, you could in fact start generating an image. And they, this led to what's called Deep Dream, which was the first, um, uh, um, the first ever exhibition of AI generated art was based on Deep Dream. And as you can see, a very trippy, trippy image comes out because of the information on where these things should be positioned um, gets lost in the process. But what you can see here is a, is a neural network that's trained on, I don't know, serpents and dogs and it's like a gas lamp there, um, eventually reads this into everything that it sees. Um, and uh, uh, this was, was you know, spectacular at the time. Um, but then the real breakthrough happened when Ian Goodfellow developed something called a generative, generative adversarial networks, where um, they, he, he basically set up two different uh, neural networks, one a generator and one a discriminator. And what happened was and they're competing against each other. So the generator is taking random noise and producing images. Then the discriminator uh, judges against a training set and decides whether it's convinced or not. And in the process, it's a bit like a... Um, in the process, it, 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 it trains the generator to improve its, to improve its act. It's a bit like a um, someone producing a fake Van Gogh than an art critic deciding whether or not he or she is convinced by that. Um, but this is kind of interesting because it kind of suggests something about how architects operate. I mean, the, the first image of reversing the flow suggests that maybe those uh, the designers are operating in a different modality to the kind of theorists and the critics or the interpreters in some way. And what you've got here is basically this is the kind of the designer, as it were, and this is the critic. And it's kind of the, the designer improves its act um, by the feedback from the from the from the from the discriminator. Um, anyway, um, this produced something quite remarkable. This was one of the early style GANs that um, that came out, trained obviously on looks like Hollywood um, movie faces and things. Um, and, and GANs were launched, so they're, they're very very hard work in terms of training the model, and um, uh, and you had to have a, quite a sophisticated background in computation. And some of the images were, weren't that high resolution, so it was a bit compromised, but nonetheless, that happened. Then, of course, uh, Charles was showing that this, this building does not exist. I should so I mentioned before that the previous image, there is a, a site, this person does not exist, where you, every time you refresh the browser, you get a face that is very, very convincing. They're all fake faces. Um, there's also a site, this cat does not exist, if you want to go and find cats as well. But anyway, this was this was a break, great breakthrough. But the real, um, uh, the first architect to, to the first image that was generated by a GAN was actually not generated by an architect. It was generated by uh, Refik Anandol, who's now a very famous media artist. And in 2019, I, I put in a proposal to curate the British Pavilion at the Venice Biennale, um, along with Zahidid Architects, with Refik Anandol, and sponsored by Google. I mean, this was a dream team as far as I was concerned. Um, and our idea was we we're going to hallucinate buildings um, in, in this thing, but we got we got nowhere. We weren't even shortlisted. It wasn't exactly a short shortlist. There were nine uh, in the shortlist. We weren't even even there. So it just goes to show the space from 2009, 19 to 2023, how things have changed. But Refik went ahead and did what we were proposed to do anyway, and 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 took the the over of uh, of uh, Sahadid architects and fed them into the computer and and um, and used his version of style GANs to um, to generate uh, an image um, and and eventually even though sadly Zaha is no longer with us you are able to generate something that kind of looks like it's vaguely uh, has been designed um, by Zaha and suddenly it kind of comes out of the computer and there it is. Um, and that was the image that I then um, put on the front cover of the, what was the first book in English. When you heard did the first book overall, it was in Chinese. The first book in English um, on AI and architecture came out in December 2021. Um, and after that, then there was a series of other um, developments. So there were a whole series of GANs. There's a whole a zoo of different GANs. This is cycle GANs, where you're taking two unpaired data sets and, and uh, instead of just simply interpolating, because in a sense, um, style GANs is just based on a finite set data set. This is breeding them off. Um, 
bringing off a, a, the over of um, of 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 Corp Himmelblau, um against I think it's geological formations for this particular one. But this was very much the, the state of the art in 2021. Um, it's called Deep Himmelblau, and uh, Wolf Pricks received a, a Cadia Lifetime Award for, for this, and also a Digital Futures Award um, um, for this project. So at the time, then, it was really the state of the art. And, it, and I guess, I mean, it wasn't too bad. Whenever you see a GAN-generated image, it's always a little bit... Um, glitchy. Um, you can see this is this kind of thing typically, and the resolution was not that great. Um, um, but anyway, that's that's what what we had at the time, and it is what we what we put on the front cover of, of of the AD Machine Hallucinations, which came out a few months later. And the, the whole first half of 2022, there's a whole um, whole deluge of well about six or seven books on on AI and architecture that came out, all of which are out of date um, for this reason. Basically, diffusion models um, appeared. Um, in the first half of towards the first in the first half of 2022, um, now diffusion models are, are very different. They're based on um, um, uh, it's a massive pre-trained model, so you don't have to do the training, um, and uh, they generate images through a kind of uh, they, they use a Markov chain and, and a Gaussian noise that does, that that uh, in, um, disrupts the image and the, and the images then repaired in some senses and it produces all these different sort of images um and it's it's it it's uh it's much quicker in the space of a few seconds you can get an image and it's based on prompts um and we become prompt engineers um and what was interesting was sort of on the early ones was that you, and I, I guess the point is that that, that uh, ai doesn't copy anything there's a mistaken idea um that you get people like Mario Carpo going on about AI copying. It does not copy. Humans copy very imperfectly, but humans copy. What AI does is searches and synthesizes. Um, and what basically it's doing here, because I don't suppose there's been an astronaut on a horse before, but it kind of takes, it looks, searches for data, and it synthesizes it. what would have happened had a, an astronaut um, been riding a horse. Um, so this was quite a quite a sensation in a way, um, but it wasn't available to, to the general public. And I remember giving a lecture at the AA in, in May of 2022 and saying, well, I wonder when, when architects are going to wake up to this, when they're going to wake up to AI, because nothing really was happening. And in the audience was Patrick Schumacher, and he said, it's already happened. We've, we've already woken up to it. And, I, and I, unbeknown to me and to anyone else, he had been collaborating with Refik Anadol um, using DALI because uh, Refik had been given access to DALI. Um, and, and they produced this work, which clearly was much superior to the initial GAN-generated image and has a sense of kind of materiality and, and three-dimensionality. Well, it's only 2D, but, but it, it has a sense of, of, of being much more than that. Um, and then, of course... Um, and the rest is history, as it were. And I would just simply say that this is um, these images are just the tip on the iceberg. And I think what Charles was showing us today was really that's the future. You know, it's not going to just be about images; it's going to be about performance. It's going to be about something completely different. And when that software comes out in two or three years' time, the whole design process is going to be transformed. But there is something interesting about these these um, these uh, diffusion model um, images um, that I'll talk about later. That actually is quite significant, I think. Um, Anyway, so um, but so so what is happening now? And I, I know that the GAN is a very different sort of model to what what what's happening here, but I think it's kind of useful to think about what's happening when when we are being enhanced or being supplemented by uh, by 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 the diffusion models. They become a kind of prosthesis, as it were, to the human imagination. Now, my view is is that actually that human beings are very very good discriminators. If we um, taste a cocktail, if we smell a, a perfume, immediately we know if we like it or not. Um, I think we're really, really good discriminators, but I don't think we're very good generators. I think we've got a very limited imagination, imagination frankly. And what's effectively happening, I think, is that is that, that mid-journey Dali and so on are, are actually giving us many more in, um, possibilities than we would have dreamt of ourselves. So I, I think this is kind of interesting. And I think increasingly we're becoming more discriminators. And people like myself, who are not terribly technologically advanced, can now generate images and things, and uh, it's it's a different sort of world we, where we're kind of not designing so much as generating outcomes and then deciding, discriminating um, between the different sort of outcomes. So anyway, that's my view. But but um, what is interesting also, this is the only the only graph or research I've found so far looking at the effect of using um, the, these. Uh, well, this is actually for Chat GPT, but. Um, but what is interesting is you're discovering that there's much the quality is there's an improvement in quality when you use this, and of course um, 
there's the, uh, it, also you, when someone is using AI, they can achieve much more than someone's not using AI, um, which kind of suggests that we're going to not need so many architects in the future. But anyway, this is kind of interesting because it simply points out that it becomes a kind of augmentation of our own abilities. Um, but to me, the question is, is AI actually creative? It generates stuff, but is it is it actually creative? And I think this is a, a kind of a controversial sort of point. And one of the interesting um, episodes in the history of AI um, was this uh, match between AlphaGo um, by DeepMind, in, uh, it was produced by DeepMind in London, which is now part of Google, um, took on Lisa Doll um, in 2016. In, in 1997, um, Deep Blue of IBM had taken on Gary Kasparov um, at chess and had beaten Gary Kasparov. Nobody expected it. Gary Kasparov, one of the greatest chess players of all time. But Ray Kurzweil had predicted that by 2000, uh, um, AI would beat the best human chess player. And sure enough, by 1997, that happened. But but uh, Go is, a, is, an, is another question entirely. Um, and even though the moves of Go are kind of straightforward in some ways, the complexity of the po in terms of the possible moves of Go makes it extremely um, extremely challenging. There are more possible moves in Go than there are atoms in the universe. And even if you put all together all the computers in the world together, you would not be able to compute. So what they had to do was to shift from the old fashioned kind of um, um, uh, uh, expert um, um, systems of the past that you use for, for the, the chess match to learning systems, to use deep learning. And this was really, I think, a triumph um, in the world of, of deep learning. Um, and no, again, nobody expected Lisa Dahl to lose. He was like the Gary Kasparov of Go. And this is interesting. There's a comment that, was, that he made after game two. Yesterday, after game one, I was surprised, but today I am speechless. This is after game two. And famously, uh, in game two, there was one particular move. It's almost like this one move is like the most important thing in the history of AI, almost. Um, because this move, 37, where, where AlphaGo put the stone there, I never played Go, but apparently... You don't put it on the fifth line, you put it on the fourth or the third line early on in the game. And it, and everybody thought it was a mistake. They thought it was a mistake. Um, but 100 moves later, these two black stones here joined up and AlphaGo won the match. Um, and in fact, it won the game and won the match overall. When I was in Seoul a couple few days ago, someone told me that apparently, you know, if you want to say someone's smart, you say, you're so AlphaGo. It's really had an impact that everybody Everybody in, in, in Korea knows about it. I think most people apparently in China know about it. It's well, The UK is not a Go playing name, the nation, but nonetheless, this happened. So I also want to play you quickly um, the, comment, the, 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 the comments by the commentator at the time, um, which was kind of interesting. The Google uh, team was talking about, uh, is this kind of um, evaluation uh, evaluation? Ooh, that's a very, that's a very surprising move. I thought it was a mistake. It was no mistake. Um, and I, what happened after that basically is, I mean, uh, AlphaGo wiped the floor. Um, and uh, 2019, Lisa, Lisa Dole gave up the game of Go on the basis that AI was an entity that could not be defeated. And he makes this comment about creativity, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, AlphaGo showed us that moves humans may have thought are creative were actually conventional. I would say the most interesting thing about this is, that in fact, is actually the fact that it we weren't able to understand what it was able to do. I mean, it has a AI has a uh, let's say a spectrum of intelligence that goes way beyond human intelligence. It's a bit like a dog has greater sense of of hearing or smell than we do. It can smell smells and 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 hear sounds that we can't. This is what's going happening now. Is it's able to operate at this kind of level. Interestingly, Fan Hui, who was the the European uh, Go champion who was commenting on the match also, he, he kept on saying how beautiful, how beautiful, how creative this move was. I, I, I've got to ask, can a machine be creative, though? Um, uh, now, in terms of the definition of creativity, uh, Margaret Bowden, who I respect in many ways, um, and she's the kind of grand old lady of, of cognitive science um, at the University of Sussex, uh, and she talks about, this is something I think that Arturo was talking about um, the other day, about these three different types of creativity, um, combinational creativity, which she talks about co uh, collage is one example of that, exploratory, where you're working within a system and you can use shape grammar perhaps to do that, and then transformational, which is really true creativity, where you, you kind of get a Nobel Prize for something that's a complete 
paradigm shift. Well, I don't know. I find this very confused. It looks like these are strategies of creativity, perhaps. It's certainly not types of creativity. I think it's very problematic. Um, and then uh, Demis Osabis of AlphaGo, of DeepMind, who was behind AlphaGo, then talks about these different types. I think he means levels of creativity. One is interpolation, extrapolation, and true creativity where you're completely thinking outside the blocks, outside the box. It strikes me that really he's talking about the difference between uh, um, a, ga a style GAN that's interpolating based on a finite uh, body of knowledge versus extrapolation when you may be breeding between different things like cycle GANs and then creativity. But that, that seems to me really more levels of creativity than types of creativity. And I've, I find both of these definitions pretty um, imperfect. Um, in terms of the books written about this, uh, Marcus de Sote buys into Margaret Bowden's one, whereas Al Arthur Miller says, well, well hold on a second. Um, that how can you judge? Who's creativity? Who's judging creativity? Uh, and I think he's absolutely right. Um, he's uh, an American uh, um, uh, who's, teach who's been teaching in, in, in UCL in London. And you know, the question is, well, how do we recognize creativity? You know, if Van Gogh wasn't even recognized in his lifetime, uh, was he creative or not? Um, and uh, or indeed, if we hadn't noticed AlphaGo, you know, would, would that have been considered creative? And I think it becomes a much more challenging issue. You can't just define it in such objective terms. Um, uh, and I think this is a very interesting. We go back to this comment by Lisa Doll. The word thought, I think, is really interesting. AlphaGo showed us that, he, that moves humans may have thought are creative, we're actually conventional, as though it's a perception of creativity rather than creativity itself. Um, uh, and, and you're left thinking, because Van Hui also mentioned it was so beautiful, these moves were so beautiful and they're so creative, whether in fact uh, creativity is a bit like beauty, it's in the in the eye of the beholder, or indeed maybe it's, it's in the, the mind of the person trying to be creative. You know, a student might think he or she's being really creative, but actually gets a B minus grade or something is not actually being creative. Um, so, you know, I, I think, and I also think that uh, this is coming out again from something that Arturo was saying, that we need to think about how the, the gaze itself operates in an interesting way, whereby we look at something as architects and we are inspired by something. In this case, the, um, the uh, oops, sorry, um, um, in this case, the uh, the sails of yachts in the harbour in, in Sydney, which inspired Jorn Utzon to produce um, this uh, um, the, the sketch for the Sydney Opera House. It didn't quite come out like that, but never mind. And some of my students have been looking at this possibility of how you can um, uh, you can train a neural network, um, and then this is in this case trained on on one of the Zaha buildings in in Saudi Arabia Research Centre. And then use that as a kind of lens um, by which we could look at, say, in this case, um, the, 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 a student called Fernando Salcedo. This is a T-shirt on the left-hand side. So in some sense, there is a way in which the gaze itself is a kind of creative act in some ways. And, and what's more, that begins to suggest that we possibly are trained in a way not so different to how a neural ne a network is trained. And here you can see he's looking at downtown Miami and a, a simple tie becomes a tower block. So there is something much more complex than these rules that were kind of put forward by Margaret Bowden or indeed Demis Osabis. Um, um, uh, now, uh, p opinions are divided on, on whether or not AI is created. Uh, is creative. Uh, uh, Memo Acton, who is um, an astonishing guy, he is, was in, based in London for a long time, uh, did a PhD at Goldsmiths, and now is at the uh, UC Santa Bar uh, Santa San Diego, uh, who takes the view that... Um, but really, I mean, in, in, the, well, I'll, I'll just read it out. By saying that a machine can be creative, you are not anthropomorphizing the machine, but liberating it by expanding the term creativity to go beyond humans. Creativity is not limited to people. I'm a biological machine. Humans can create art. Why can't machines? Well, I think the problem ultimately is that maybe he is anthropomorphizing. And uh, this is a little bit of the video that was done, uh, uh, some research by two psychologists where they uh, had a group of, of um of uh, um, well, they 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 had a, a, a sample group of sixty people, and they were they showed them this video and said, "Well, what do you, what do you think's happening here?" Um, and everyone came up to the conclusion that actually there were these um, there were these two uh, triangles, one rather aggressive attacking the smaller triangle. Meanwhile, the circle was teaming up with the small triangle, and they were kind of operating together, and uh, it was all about this. Well. 
actually they're just triangles and circles and things. But they, it just show how humans are kind of uh, meaning making machines and how we kind of project our worldview onto things. Um, well, I won't go down that avenue, but there's a lot of uh, that it helps to explain what religion's all about. We try and find meaning in everything. So we tend to anthropomorphize things. We tend to see things in human terms, even though um, they may may not have any particular connections. So that's the real risk. And if when you have a term like intelligence, you you can anthropomorphize. You see it in terms of human intelligence or even in, indeed terms like learning um, and so on. There's a real danger. When we look at AI, we start thinking it's like a human and, and it's got consciousness and so on. Um, now, um, according to Melanie Mitchell, um, who this is a really good book on AI, I would say, um, uh, you can't be creative unless you're conscious of being creative. Well, in some senses, when the human's in the loop, um, then in some senses, there is a sense of consciousness because humans are conscious to some extent. But but she doesn't think that uh, computers can be creative. At the same time, it's it's probably worth saying that maybe we humans are not fully um, conscious of what we're doing. Um, and this is the work of Max Tegmark, who I'll come across and uh, talk about a bit later on um, in IT, who um, basically says, well, there are many things that we do that we're not aware of. Some things are instinctual, a fly comes and you blink or something. Um, so we're not always uh, c conscious of what we're doing. Um, Paul Shannon, who was one of the was one of those figures back in um, uh, the, the the first ever meeting about um, um, uh, 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 at Dartmouth College, um, really thinks it's we're talking about information processing. It's not intelligence as such. It's a straightforward process of information, which I think is probably a healthy way of looking at AI. Um, and then Margaret Bowden, having written several articles about it, kind of at the end of it, she said, "Well." Whether a computer can ever be really creative is not a scientific question, but a philosophical one. And it's currently unanswerable because it involves several highly contentious and highly unclear philosophical questions. I mean, you think, well, why didn't you say that at the very beginning rather than taking on this long journey about whether computers could be creative? So I don't think they can be creative. I think that AlphaGo is ultimately doing a very effective search and synthesis exercise. Um, um, uh, whatever. But then the question comes up, the well, are human beings creative? We like to think we are, right? Um, but I want to be, I like being provocative, so I'm going to be extremely provocative today. Um, and uh, um, going back to this thing, well, you know, we think we're creative. We think we're creative, but are we? Um, now, um, Turing, as you know, um, came up with this idea of the Turing test to 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 see how um, convincing um AI could be, and could you? Would you miss? Would you um, miss, miss, mistake um, a computer for a human being? And as we know, this is what happens. There's a, as a, there's, there's, there's a somebody who is examining these things and doesn't know that what's behind the screen, as it were, and is is trying to see whether this machine is, which whether it is convincingly like a human. Um, well, the problem with that is really it just gives the impression possibly of being that. This is a uh, John Searle, who's a philosopher at the University of uh, um, uh, of the Berkeley, um, um, UC Berkeley, who actually uses this 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 to describe that actually to to say that actually computers can't be conscious. Um, um, but you could also kind of think about it in terms of whether they can be creative in some way. So, so what's happening here, and I don't know if it's authentic Chinese there, but there are two individuals outside this room. It's called a Chinese room experiment. And inside, there's this person here who doesn't speak any Chinese. It's just simply following the rule books and, and, and you know, take a squiggle, squiggle sign from basket number one and put it next to a squiggle, squiggle sign in basket number two and produces something that they think is... Um, is authentic Chinese, and they think therefore he, that this person inside knows can, can speak Chinese, but actually he doesn't. So uh, I, I want to say that that is an interesting sort of uh, you, you can use that to critique the Turing test. It might appear that a, a computer is like a human being, but actually you're just falling into a trap. Um, um, so the question about creativity, um, I want to kind of pitch this in, and this is very much kind of speculative thinking um, as to whether or not we can um, call, what is creativity? Uh, uh, and um, I want to compare it to both magic and technology. Um, so um, you've probably seen this Bot and Dolly movie, which is really more a kind of a demonstration of what they can do in terms of their special effects. And uh, these are just uh, uh, robotic arms, and they're, they're coming up with these illusions, and it looks very effective. Um, 
And you can be thinking, wow, this is impressive. This is three-dimensional, but it's not. It's just a kind of a set of, of visual um, illusions. Um, and they finished the video. I'm not going to play it to the end, but they finished the video by, but with a quote from um, uh, Arthur C. Clarke, where he says that any sufficient advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Um, now, I, I would rephrase that slightly and say any sufficiently advanced technology seems like magic. But it's not, I don't think. Um, so um, and then I want to bring in a comment that, that Margaret Bowden says, and I, I agree with this. There's nothing magical about creativity. So we've got there's nothing magical about technology, even though we might think it's magical. And there's nothing magical about creativity. Uh, and then um, I would claim there's nothing magical about magic, because actually what's happening when you see a magic trick is that the, the magician is just a conjurer is just hiding the the operations at work trying to convince you it's magic but actually there are, there's a technique going on right and it's nothing at all magic in fact magic i don't think exists that's, that's my view anyway um so here you have three situations three conditions there is nothing magical about technology there's nothing magical about creativity and there is nothing magical about magic so the question is is there anything creative about creativity and this is a, a, a comment attributed to Arthur C. Clarke. We don't know for sure. Magic is just science that we don't understand. Um, um, is creativity just information processing that we don't understand? I, I kind of suspect that it might be. So this is getting to the dystopian side. I think it's good to end up on a conference on a very dystopian edge, right? Um, so um, I think one of the things that, I, that everybody working in the field was pretty blown away by how how effective ChatGPT was and Midjourney and Dali and so on. We never quite expected it to be as good as it is. And we certainly didn't want to expect it to be 10,000 times smarter than, than, than human beings. And that's what the figure is quoted around, that ChatGPT knows 10,000 times more than any human being. And that's kind of led to a, a kind of panic, which we haven't really experienced in architecture, but certainly those leaders in the field of AI um, are, are really concerned about. And it's it's really based on these things that, that we don't really talk about um, large language models, but that is really what is behind it, the, the, the GPT in chat GPT. And what these are, I mean, the term large is a kind of understatement. These are absolutely gigantic pre-trained neural networks that have, are based on trillions of bits and have got uh, uh, billions of parameters. They are absolutely enormous. They're absolutely enormous. But the interesting thing about them is they don't have many lines of code computationally, they're quite um, straightforward. Um, but anyway, this is what's been causing a lot of panic. And, and this, um, this letter here, for example, that was um, uh, 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 published by, by Max Tegmark and the Future of Life Institute, calling for a halt in the development of these large language models. Um, that was one of the kind of issues. Then we get uh, Hinton himself worried about what's happening in terms of what he developed. And then Joshua Bengio, who was part of his team um, at Toronto, also worried about, about that. And then the general public also getting concerned about AI. There is some kind of panic that is setting in. Now, what is interesting, this is the letter that the Future of Life Institute um, wrote. And it's it it um uh, and if you go through it, what is there's an interest there's an interesting um comment on the second page, which I find uh, the second paragraph is really interesting. Um, where they're calling for a halt until they know exactly what's going on. And this is this final sentence here, this does not mean a pause on AI development in general, merely a stepping back from the dangerous race to ever larger, unpredictable black box models with emergent capabilities. Now, I think most people read that and they think, I don't know what that means, skip to the next sentence. But I want to just focus on this term emergent capabilities because what that means basically is um, the fact that these large language models were never trained um, to, to learn language. They, they actually, all they do, um, well, ChatGPT only predicts the next word in the sentence. Um, Palm, the Google version of that, uh, it predicts a missing word in the sentence and it somehow they, they develop these, what they're called emergent capabilities. They're able to translate languages, to, to write code, things that were, were just truly astonishing. They've developed this thing, and it's not because of the, the sophistication of, 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 of the algorithm, because it's not very sophisticated. It's rather based on the sheer size. And there is a phenomenon um, 
in science called emergence. And John Holland wrote about this back in I think, the late 80s. Um, and more recently, Stephen, um, uh, um, I'm going to his name now. Um, uh, 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 anyway, there, there, was, there was another book on, on, um, uh, on emergence that became a popular bestseller. And what they're talking about is this kind of process where, whereby a multi-agent system, and then in the book Emergence, it, it compares how you can get cities and brains and insects and computers, and they all operate in this same principle. Any multi-agent system displays these bottom-up emergent um, tendencies. And here we see in Brighton a, a flock of, of starlings um, coming into roost in the evening. And, and what's happening is actually the birds themselves are just following very basic rules to like keep a certain distance from the bird on either side and go broadly in the same direction, the same speed. But something emerges, a kind of collective behavior that is caused emer called, called emergence. Um, and you get this beautiful um, aerial uh, choreography. Of course, the birds themselves are not aware of that, but from the outside, you can see that. And you can also see emergence appearing in the kind of stigma of, of ants when they lay pheromone trails. Um, and you can see it in, in, in the, the way that a slime mold, which is basically uh, thousands of, of, of entities coming together collectively into a single body um, in, in order to um, go foraging for food. So what happens is that the, 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 uh, the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, and they start developing this unpredictable behavior, this emergent behavior. It's as though it takes on a life of its own. And this is the issue. And the problem is we can observe these things. We can see emergence. We can see flocks of birds doing these things. Uh, and we that's clear enough, but no scientist can understand this. In fact, some forms of emergent emergence are described as being a little like magic. So what do we make of this? Well, I want to go back to this guy, Jeffrey Hinton, who, you know, he's the godfather of AI. He's the one who gave us these neural networks and so on. And he also was deeply, has been deeply alarmed by um, these developments and what's happening. And one of the things I wrote about in my book um, was that basically AI doesn't think, you know, and uh, at least that's what we thought. Um, and uh, and I think I made a comment like it doesn't think any more, it has no more capacity to think than your pocket calculator. Um, now he's, Jeffrey Hinton's revised his view. So I don't know, he just wanted you to listen to him and and the, what to what he's saying in terms of um, what AI can do now. Um, it made me realize that the digital intelligence has something we don't have that makes them much better. When one of them knows something, it can tell all the others that's what we don't have in the future. So imagine you had 10,000 people, and imagine if when one person learned something, everybody knew it. You could learn a lot more stuff, right? right. And that's why things like chat GPT knows like 10,000 times as much as any one person. It's because when you train it, there's lots of different copies looking at different bits of the data and learning stuff, and they can all combine what they learn instantly with a bandwidth of like trillions of bits. So can they think? Yes. So imagine the following scenario. I'm talking chatbot and we talk for a bit and the answers it's given me seem a bit strange to me. And I suddenly realize that it thinks I'm a teenage girl. And I think, what demographic do you think I am? And it says it thinks I'm a teenage girl. Um, so the question is, when I say it's, I suddenly realize it thinks I'm a teenage girl. Was that a metaphorical use of the word thing? Or was that just the same way we use this? And I strongly believe that use of the word think, when I said it thinks I'm a teenage girl, was exactly the same way of using think as we do with you. And so that was enough to make you say, what, this has accelerated beyond my comfort level? I suddenly were like, maybe they already are better. I'm making them more like me on the all that different point. They're already better than us. They're a better way of doing learning. And if we make them bigger, they'll get much smarter. They already know me in one person. I, I understand that things can go awry, but I still think that people fear the notion of danger and they dismiss it as hyperbole. I thought it was hyperbole for a long time because I thought these things were a long way off. I thought there will eventually be danger, but I thought. Um, focusing on it now is unnecessary because it'll be 30 to 50 years before these things get more intelligent than us. But this combination of realizing that they might have a much better way of learning than we have, because they can share knowledge instantly, 
And seeing things like ChatGPT or Palm or Google, that can explain why a joke is funny, made me realize these things are already pretty intelligent. And if they've got a better form of intelligence than ours, then it gets to be much more urgent. So just to explain, um, the reference to a joke is it, uh, it that uh, Hinton used Palm and he asked it to explain a joke. And he figured if it can explain a joke, it must understand a joke. And then he goes on to basically develop this idea that actually that, that AI has a form of intelligence that is, albeit not the same as human intelligence, is a very different sort of kind of, it's, a, uh, it's not a biological intelligence, but it is way superior to human intelligence. You know, chat GPT knows 10,000 times more, and the prediction is that in a few years, AI will know a billion times more than we do. Whether or not they can think, I, I'm not sure at all. I would use inverted commas. In fact, I would use inverted commas for everything here. But the point is that what he's saying is that we weren't expecting this to happen. It had been predicted that there was the different stages we'd go through. Um, like, for example, there was the singularity. It's about to, maybe the singularity has already happened, this explosion of knowledge. And the notion of there being a super intelligence whereby AI could invent other AIs and we would be that would be the last invention we would need to make. I mean, I was listening the other day to Sam Altman saying that you can use GPT to generate other GPTs. So I don't know whether we're in that kind of system yet, but I strongly believe that there is a form of intelligence that, that it has that is way superior to human intelligence. Um, in, uh, uh, so this is um, Yuval Harari, who I've been using the term alien intelligence for some time. In fact, in my book, I refer to it as, uh, it's as though the earth has been invaded by a uh, uh, um, uh, uh, some super intelligent alien species. Um, and uh, he uses the exact same term. So let me just play Yuval Harari, who's also disturbed by this. Harari is a, is a kind of more philosopher figure rather than a bit of technologist, but he's actually pretty smart. This is the end of human history, the end of human dominated history. History will continue with somebody else in control. In five years, there'll be a technology that can make decisions independently and that can create new ideas independently. Maybe they'll be nuts. Maybe they'll solve cancer and climate change, but we are not sure. I'm tending to think of it more in, in terms of, of really an alien invasion, an alien fleet of spaceships coming from planet Zircon or whatever with, with highly intelligent beings. This is what we are facing, except that the aliens are not coming spaceships from planet Zircon, they are coming from the laboratory. If the humans are divided among themselves and are in an, in an arms race, then it's, it becomes almost impossible to contain this alien intelligence. So the reason why I use the term alien intelligence is it really forces you to, to not anthropomorphize intelligence. It's absolutely not the same as human intelligence, but nonetheless, I would claim it is superior. And our problem really has been that we've been looking down on AI and saying, well, it can't do this. It hasn't got consciousness and so on. What if we were to take the AI point of view and think what well, looking down on us, you know, these dumb creatures um, and, and reverse that. So on this trip I'm doing um, at the moment, I'm, I'm going to go to Warsaw for a conference where, um, well, Nicholas Copernicus came from Poland. And of course, he famously pointed out that the universe doesn't revolve around the earth, rather the earth revolves around the sun. And I think what we've got to recognize is that we are not the center of intelligence in the universe anymore. There is something out there um, that maybe doesn't have consciousness, but maybe doesn't need to have consciousness. It's far superior. In fact, Yuval Harari makes a comment about this. He says that there was a, a Google car that was once crashed into by a human-driven car. Now, um, we all heard of Google cars crashing because they were certainly very unreliable and probably still are to some extent, but eventually they will be completely reliable but human beings will never lose distraction. I don't know what that person was doing, whether they're checking their, their messages or something like that. But anyway, the point being that maybe, maybe consciousness is not necessary. I mean, Harari's point of view, as long as it's effective, as long as it does its job, who cares about consciousness? You know, as long as my toaster toasts to bread properly, I don't care whether it's not, whether or not it's consciousness, whether it's conscious. So maybe we need to kind of shift our, our viewpoint instead of looking down on AI. Really, I recognize that, that is, there is an entity that is way, way beyond us. Um, so um, there is a, a further comment, actually, that, that was made by Harari uh, before that. Um, he makes this comment that Yuval Harari, that, that, that AI has hacked the operating system of human civilization, by which it means 
It's learned how to use language. And once you know how to use language, then you have an enormous power because you can persuade people to do certain things. Now, I completely agree with that. It's learned how to use language. It's learned how to translate languages. And it's learned how to write code. And I want to claim it's learned how to design or it's learned the rules, the principles of design. So let me go back to one of just, I mean, this could be any of the, of the images I showed you, but this is a, um, a, a bit journey five, version 5.2 like the other ones. And I don't know, I, Arturo has very short uh, prompts. I got the enormously long prompts. Um, and they make references to all sorts of things. They make references to um, the rendering, to the ultra hyperistic, ultra uh, uh, hyperistic details, the lighting conditions, and so on, and so on, and so on. But actually, in this prompt, the only words to use to describe architecture were ultra contemporary minimalist house in the Austrian Alps. That is all I put in it. Midjourney did the rest. It designed this thing. It generated this thing. It did put in the, the mountains, the valley in the background. I didn't describe that. It put in the boulder, the grass in the foreground. I didn't describe any of those things. Midjourney did it all. It's as though it has learned the rules of composition. This is a, 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 a kitchen, a stainless steel kitchen. And all I put was uh, ultra contemporary minimalist uh, stainless steel kitchen. I didn't specify this painting in the background, which is quite a nice painting. I didn't put this bush in the side or the, the tap or the, the coffee maker. I didn't do any of that. It did it all automatically. Um, and or this one, for example, you know, it, it, it has a sense of, 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 of the, how things materials are put together, kind of tectonics of materials, and it, and it generates pretty convincing images of, 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 of that, or indeed rendering. I mean, I, I think that renderers are out of a job, right, <laughs> pretty soon. I mean, I don't know how long it would take for, a, um, for someone to, to render this, but this is done in three seconds. This is stunning. This is stunning. It has learned how to, it's learned the rules of composition. <laughs> Whether you can say it's design or not, I don't know. And whether you can say it's creative or not, I doubt. Um, but I would question whether you could call human beings creative. So I want to finish off, um, again, being a slightly British here. Um, this is a book, um, uh, Douglas Adams, that was became a movie and whatever else. And Douglas Adams was a, also a student at the University of Cambridge and John's College. And this was something I was brought up with. It was a it had a huge impact on me and, and everyone else in our, um, in our generation. I don't know how many people know about this particular book, but it, you should read it. It's really amazing. But interestingly, there is a there is a, a computer in it which um, called Deep Thought. Right um, now, it, it it gives the answer to life, the universe, and everything. And and this is actually it's very important. This is this book for Elon Musk is super important because. It, it it it's a it's a book about philosophy because it basically is saying you've got to ask the right questions. The problem is they, they came up the it came up with the answer to life, the universe, and everything, which is forty two, and, and then they kind of thought, well, uh, so um, what's the question then? You know, and um, but the point is, it took ten million years to come up with this answer, and it was going to take another nine million years to come up with the question. Um, Chat GPT could do it in three seconds. Um, and I think that it's hacked into our, 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 our language, into our code, and, and into our design. I'm pretty sure it's hacked into the life, the, the question of the, the, the human DNA or something, or cultural DNA, what it is to be human, life, the universe, and everything. Um, so on the back cover of the book, it says, uh, don't panic. Um, I'm sure, John, you've seen this one, right? I mean... So I want to finish off with another Brit. Um, and we also mentioned before, Arthur C. Clarke. Now, this is astonishing. This is amazing. Now, 1964, he writes this. Now, now the problem when you're looking at AI and, 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 uh, and, and, the, and the brain is that both, as I mentioned, are, are kind of completely, are complete black boxes. We've no idea what's going on either. And therefore, it's difficult to make any comparisons. But at the same time, it's kind of interesting. You can speculate based on pretty much nothing. And this is really what Arthur C. Clarke has to say. So um, let's listen to what he had to say. 1964, pretty astonishing. He's almost talking about what's happening right now. Apparently, most intelligent inhabitants of that future world won't be men or monkeys. They'll be machines, the remote descendants of today's computers. 
Now, the present-day electronic brains are complete morons, but this will not be true in another generation. They will start to think, and eventually they will completely outthink their makers. Is this depressing? I don't see why it should be. We superseded the Cro-Magnon and Neanderthal men, and we presume we're an improvement. I think we should regard it as a privilege to be stepping stones to higher things. I suspect that organic or biological evolution has about come to its end. We are now at the beginning of inorganic or mechanical evolution, which will be a thousands of times swifter. So I'm just going to leave you with a final other British version of that. Don't panic. Keep calm and carry on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neil. And is there any question? Thanks for providing a very entertaining way out of the current AI debate. I like that you bring in the uh, the uh, to the galaxy, but you made a very short quiz with the CatGPT can can generate all these uh, questions. In the book, they build another computer that takes about four billion years. Nine, to, not nine, yeah. Nine, yeah. Uh, and they follow the Earth. So mm. Earth is mm. actually a computer mm. to generate questions. Mm. And I think that is quite interesting. So why do you say that ChatGPT can come up with this so quickly? Why, why do you take, why do you focus on the question? Um, Actually, I asked John Fraser that, and I said, is there a computer? And he just dismissed it completely. Um, um, well, I don't know. I, I was kind of thinking also of Cedric Price's uh, question, uh, the, the technology is the answer. <laughs> what is the question? Um, I, I mean, I, I, I'm interested by how these systems are able to, and I think they just understand systems. I think that's what they're doing. They understand language, understand code, and so on. Um, and I'm pretty sure there are things that they know that we haven't understood they know already. That's why I'm suggesting that they can probably understand the cultural DNA, as it were, of what the the, the, um, the Earth is all about. But um, I, I, I'm, not, I'm just speculating. I'm not making any particular claims, but I, I do think that... Um, uh, I guess the message is simply that, that, that these are astonishingly powerful things and we've got to wake up and realize that we're not so much in control of things. I, that's why I think the, the, the second Copernican revolution is, is the viewpoint that I, I've got. Um, so, I mean, I, there's no real argument there. I'm just simply kind of pointing something out. Um, there can't be an argument um, because it's just pure speculation. Um, does that answer your question, Lee? We need a longer discussion. Okay, we need a longer. Yeah, we do. We do. But um, yeah. Second question from uh, Abal. Uh, thank you, Neil, for such a great and inspirational uh, presentation. Um, I really like that you use you know this kind of balance between the good and the bad and positive and negative. I think it was really really good. Um, my question, I'm a designer, so um, I'm shifting a little bit from architecture and all these kind of uh, nice design images, and uh, I, I try to remove that. And I would like to know where you see social aspects of AI in design, for example. Do you think that AI at some point will have the chance to have the good deed and the bad deed when the, we might ask AI to help us to do a social action, social design, try to help people change uh, or improve life um, conditions? Do you have maybe uh, something that you can tell us about this? Yeah. Um, well, I, you know, I think it's just a tool, frankly. And I mean, I know it, 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 a tool is neither good nor evil. And I can cut up my vegetables with a kitchen knife or I could murder you with the, the tool. But no kitchen knife has ever been convicted of a murder so far. And it's really, it doesn't have intentionality as yet. I, I think well, the only thing it could do, if you ask it to do something, uh, it, en route to getting there. I mean, for example, one of my students um, put into the, 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 the asked uh, of early version of ChatGPT, how do you how do you solve the problem of of climate change? Well, it basically said, well, human beings are the problem. Get rid of human beings. So maybe we get to be collateral damage in, in that. So it doesn't have that social responsibility yet. But that's not to say it's not going to de develop it so, at some point. It doesn't have intentionality. Um, 
Um, maybe I could just say something about the negative side of it. It came up from Charles in some senses. You know, the, I, you know, from to my mind, it's not evil, but it is terrifying because it's so capable. That's my view. You know, and so I use this kind of yin yang model to think about it. There's a black and there's a white side, and in the black there's a white bit, and the white bit there's a black bit. So the the dark side is already. In in the first book, at the end of the first book, I say, well, listen, eventually AI is going to be able to design buildings completely autonomously. Isn't that amazing? Well, yeah, except if you're a designer and you get kicked out of a job. But I, I think there was something in what Charles was saying earlier on. That's why I asked him this question, which is kind of pointing towards the positive side. In this dark world in which we could lose all our jobs, and frankly, I think we've got to acknowledge that. I'm astonished that nobody in architecture is even talking about that. They say, oh, no, I don't think so. I published something in Design recently where there were two groups, AI people say, yeah, of course it's true. It's, of course it's going to, we're going to lose our jobs. Other people will kind of say, no, 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 nonsense. There's not a single AI out there, AI out there that's got anywhere near the ingenuity and creativity that I've got. Well, I mean, that's kind of absurd. But I do think in, in the black side of the yin-yang thing, there is a white glimmer of hope, which is to say, I think we could all become developers. And what Charles was saying, he was laying out these rules to help developers. We, why don't we do that? Why don't we, why don't we sell the buildings as well? And that's where you make the money. But um, no, so I, I don't think as yet that it has intentionality. Therefore, it's not, it can't be good or evil. It's just simply a tool. Um, now, we can project things onto it. I think this was the problem with this guy in uh, the Google engineer, I forget his name now, last summer, who was kind of, well, he wasn't sacked for thinking that, that that AI had consciousness. He was thinking he was sacked because he disclosed some um, previous information and gave it out to the general public. But um, I don't think it's got consciousness, um, and uh, not yet, but maybe it will have. But um, So it, it could be programmed. I will say one thing. Some of the kind of critiques of AI are, are again, falling into the trap of, of, of blaming AI. They say, no, for example, AI has got bias. Well, Yes, but where does it get it bias from? It gets its bias from us. It's just collecting data from 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 the web, you know. And if you put in the word nurse on Google and, and you get females, you know, that's because the bias is in our society. You know, likewise, you know, I think that you could in the wrong society you can use um, a facial recognition in a very negative way, but it's also very useful because we can open our phones with it. So it's just a tool at the moment. It has no agency as such, but who's who's to say that it's not going to develop some kind of agency in the future? I, I somehow doubt it, but but maybe it will. Next one, Charles. Well, I think my question is, uh, before AI reach super intelligent, as you mentioned earlier, in the near future, uh, going back to architecture, I think people in your industry believe uh, prompt-based uh, 3D model generation would be a game changer. Do you agree to that statement? And then secondly, I mean, you're digging it. Well, let me, let me, let me, I'll maybe answer that first one because I'll, I'll forget it. No, I, I totally agree with that. Um, 2D to 3D, that was, I was asking that question. Um, you know, one of the things I was thinking, because I've been generating all this stuff and I get all these people asking me to build these things and I'm, you know, I haven't got to practice. I'm, I'm, I am a, a licensed architect, but I haven't got to practice. And it struck me that actually the real problem is in three seconds, you can you can actually generate using the same prompt as you do for buildings, an entire catwalk for, for Paris fashion shows. It's just, boom, amazing. Um, uh, the problem really is, is you can generate a design really quickly but then building takes like you know, three years or something like that. And I actually thought, well, maybe the way forward is to do it, is to basically do 3D printed jewelry. And all you've got to do is make that 2D to 3D step and you get it 3D printed in China in four days, you could do it. So, um, but uh, yeah, 2D to 3D is absolutely the question. And, and that's why I was asking you about it. And I think it's it's super complicated, but that's the, that's the way forward. We had some, by the way, if anyone's interested in, in some of these, um, in finding out about these things, there are these things on on uh, um, uh, on, on digital futures. We have a series of sessions, and they're kind of exploring how you can kind of make things into three D. Um, but um, but it's still early. But that is the, that is the key. That's the key. That's the key. Yeah. I was in Los Angeles last trip, and then met a lot of people from Hollywood, and they're start looking at three D generating movie sets. So, do you believe uh, entertainment industry will crack this problem? 
before architecture? Uh, well, I, I, I think, first of all, we should be paying attention, like the Hollywood actors and scriptwriters, <laughs> to the threat. I mean, that, that these arch I mean, architects have got their head in the sand like ostriches. It's unbelievable, unbelievable. You know, I think that, and actually, when you make this comment, but she, she denied it now, but one person using AI can achieve as much as five people not using AI. I think that's the point. That's why we won't need so many architects and why we won't need so many professors in the future either. Um, but no, I think so. And I think that the gaming industry is probably going to tell us how to do it. You know, uh, we already got um, uh, uh, GPUs from the, from the gaming world. So I, I, I suspect that's where it's going to, going to go. So I feel sorry for these people who are kind of designing for the metaverse who think they've got this original take because frankly that'll be done automatically very very soon um yeah i yeah no and i agree okay it, it could work no sorry um neil thank you for the the lecture oh sorry okay no time. Um, <laughs> you made a lot of provocations actually i'm going to make um counter provocation so Sometimes, in a turning point, don't you think that there is some misunderstanding in mixing or using the word creativity as a symptom of intelligence? Because in the end, creativity is just a part of the intelligence. Like right? being tolerant is also being smart or intelligent. Being compassionate is also being smart. Because of course, if if uh, an AI suggests that we are the problem of sustainability in the world. Yeah, that's understandable, but that's not very smart as, as an answer. So don't you think that um, there should be something more specific to define intelligence, not just having a system that by creating uh, some kind of brute force attack in terms of creating an uh, infinite amount of solutions to, or fancy solutions to a problem, uh, instead of bringing up one idea that actually can solve the problem in a rational and intelligent way, that problem would be a symptom of, of intelligence, not just any possible solution that might be or might be not resembling solutions that, that, are, that we are already capable of, of providing, like the rendering that uh, we journey can generate, mm. actually the rendering that all of us can do, mm. right? Mm. Just with slight variations, thousands of slight variations, right? But there's not the best solution. There's just one possible solution. Mm, mm. So when do you think that AI would finally start providing some kind of real solutions to actual problems? Well, I mean, first of all, the, 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 what's happening with these diffusion models is not narrowing down on one solution. That's what optimization was about. And topological optimization was actually part of good old fashioned AI. And what people like John Fraser were doing was trying to do the opposite, to open up the range of possibilities. And I think that's what they do by throwing out other other possibilities. Um, um, so uh, so sure, I mean, I, I think that in the end, whatever, how we call intelligence, and I do think we've got to try and you know, not anthropomorphize that term. That is the key. So people talk about consciousness, and, and actually, consciousness is not necessarily a property of intelligence either. I mean, intelligence it seems to be the, the key thing. I'm simply trying to burst a bubble in, in creativity, because I think it's kind of, there's a myth about creativity. We lose use the word very loosely, and what does it mean? You know, so, so I, I guess... I'm actually more interested in the human. That's why I'm thinking about AI as a, as a mirror to, to what it, to what humans are all about. And over and over again, you come up with this kind of question about how it can give us insights into how we operate. You know, um, like that model I showed you of, 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 of uh, my student did. You know, I think we are trained like a like a like a neural network. That it kind of shows how we are trained. I mean, I, one of the things that I write about in my book is to say, well, you know. Um, Let's take a rainbow. If you ask any kid anywhere in the world, I'm sure in Italy as well, how many colors are in a rainbow? And everyone will say seven. And you think, what? You know, there's an infinite spectrum of colors in the rainbow, but we're trained to think that. We're trained in architecture to think that a, that a flat roof is functional. But in my country, it's not functional because it rains so much and they always leak. And I think it's it's really a kind of question of, of trying to, to look at that thing and, and, and question it. So... I, I don't know what the answer is, but I think there are a lot of very loose terms that are being used that are that are that are very difficult. But the problem is, I mean, all, all these terms like consciousness, they're incredibly difficult terms to to deal with. Um, and I think creativity is just one of those terms as well. Um, but I will say this is I think I think the world of neuroscience is giving us a real glimpse about you know how we can begin to sort of see the world. And I don't know if you know people like Anil Seth, but 
unbelievably brilliant neuroscientists who have done a PhD in AI and are trying to understand how the, new, the human mind works. So right now we're getting a kind of convergence between these different worlds and they're opening up all sorts of interesting kind of questions, um, which I find fascinating. I mean, breaking down the divide between arts and sciences, also between industry and the world of academia, because Demis Osabis, for example, has got a PhD, but he's working in industry and so on. So there's a kind of melting pot of ideas that is going around that I think will hope, hope, hopefully open up and challenge many of these preconceptions. But I, I, I'm not sure I've got an answer to any of these things. In fact, they are very, very difficult kind of questions. But I think that now it, it prompts us to think about things we've taken for granted in the past and to challenge the preconceptions that we've had. So, yeah, I'm not sure I can answer your question. Last question from Jalud. Thank you, Dr. English. I have, a, I have a question. It's about for uh, bigger picture. And my question is, since we are talking about shifting of the, our main media of recording our knowledge, our history, and uh, we are shifting from taking physical records, you know, by our okay. study with our civilization, we store our knowledge from stone or paper or bamboo, and now we are using digital tools. And uh, since we are talking about uh, the lifelong expectation of the human beings are like 80 to 90 years, but for a digital, uh, I mean, uh, the life of digital life is quite eternal for us, plugged into our electric electricity. And my question will be, um, by spreading the use of digital tools, is there any possibility that the history of the human being uh, will be anyway rewritten by our AI? And, uh, and so as the future generation, we learn a biased version of us, of our histories, of our ancestors. And uh, since I, I learned, you know, this knowledge from our footprint from the internet. And I don't know, without going so far, if an extraterrestrial living being is reading Twitter or Weibo, they're not getting a really good impression of us. And what will be for the future generations, what will be their impressions about us and about human? Um, well, there are lots of things in that question. Um, uh, well, let me say, first of all, is that there is a theory, um, and I'm blanking on his name, um, an actually he's British, but he works in Australia, a computer scientist who wrote a book called Machines That Think. And he thinks that we will live on, you know, well, there'll be a digital model of ourselves that will live on and comfort you know, our family when we're gone. And certainly what we're seeing, and there's also... Um, um, uh, one of the co-founders of DeepMind, um, Mustafa Suleiman, who's talking about how we will all have a kind of personal digital twin who will be someone that our kind of PA that we will talk to and, and get advice from and so on. So I could somehow see that we will live on. I mean, Zaha's living on, right? I mean, she's gone, right? But she's kind of like, she's in every single prompt just about because of that. So um, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure how to answer your question. Um but I think we're we we it, it's this this thing is going to change a lot of things in how we perceive reality and things. And I I don't know what is reality. It's the first question. The first so uh, there is an interesting essay with, um, that that uh, um, Slavoj Žižek wrote, and I published in one of my books where where we we talk about how um, uh, reality um, versus virtual reality. And what he says basically is. When you look at virtual reality, when you understand through the lens of psychoanalysis, you realize that reality itself is somehow totally virtualized in the first place. How we perceive reality, and that's exactly what neuroscientists say now, is a kind of like a, 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 a through our imagination, it's a kind of a hallucination of some kinds. So I, I think a lot of these, what, what makes me so excited as a theorist is like all these issues have been thrown up by the world of AI. And for the first time, I think it's a real challenge for a theorist to think about these things. So questions of consciousness, which are consciousness, which are deeply philosophical questions, are now being raised by that. And I think the ones that you refer to too, it's it's almost like it's opening up a Pandora's box of different questions. I think I think Arturo's uh, amazing lecture of the day was open up this incredible Pandora's box of questions. So I don't have the answer, but I, in some ways. You've got to, as a theorist, you've got to ask questions. You've got to challenge things and ask questions. And that's what theory is about. It's not about manifestos. It's about questioning things and challenging things. And this is the ultimate theoretical moment for me when we are really forced to ask questions about ourselves in the in the in the mirror of AI. So, yeah. So, are you suggesting we can? And no, no, no. 
Are you saying that we can learn about human nature by studying AI? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Everyone said this, right? Um, everybody. Um, um, I don't know, even even I, I recall the, the movie um, Blade Runner, um, and uh, I forget the name of the Dutch actor with the blonde hair um, who played... Uh, Rutger Hauer, yeah. He said, actually, R Blade Runner wasn't about, about but replicants. It was about human beings. There's also a Japanese roboticist who makes these replica humanoid robots. Um, and I forget his name, too. And he said that by looking at these robots, we can understand what it is to be human. And I, you can't say anything concrete, but it does provoke questions about how we operate. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. You, you said that yesterday Arturo opened up the Pandora's box and he has something else in his Pandora's box that he wants to take up. Yeah. The very, the very last provocative uh, question from my side. I mean, I guess that we are somehow liquefying our architecture. When I say liquefying, it's like uh, everything is uh, getting this uh, data shape. And so I see a risk or maybe uh, an opportunity. Do you think that the, the role of architects, as we, in a way, it's, uh, will disappear? And is there the risk that architecture will be something um, belonging to big corporation? And uh, when I say big corporation, I mean also uh, the role of the architecture offices or the role of uh, the individual professional would completely disappear and would be managed by you know centralized uh, systems or. Uh, not only software, but I, I, I think something like, you know, like a giant, um, I, I would like to, to be very, very, very direct. So maybe uh, Amazon or Airbnb will be the next, uh, you know, architect. Um, is there this kind of risk? Also, because probably at current state, yeah, like architects are not that prepared to absorb all these changes. Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, actually, someone was showing me what they asked ChatGPT, and if you ask ChatGPT, will the architect disappear? It comes up with, it's been pre-trained to come up with some nice blum, vanilla answer, but then they say, what do you really mean? And it's kind of it's saying that actually it could lead to some generic dystopia in some ways. I mean, my concern actually about architects is, is, is and it's, I think, you know, you ask people and they say, oh, no, we'll be fine, we'll be fine. Well, Patrick Schumacher says that because he will be fine because you know star architects will survive you know but the real danger the real danger is actually something similar to what happened in China will happen to architecture and that is the moment in China the fees have just dropped down to about two percent or something for a big building compared to five percent and that is really dangerous you know I think and, and I know people for example in um, in LA Guven Chosel, who teaches at uh, UCLA he's got a five person practice they're producing stadiums they're producing huge projects competing against the big guys and they're doing it with a small group of people now the problem here is that i think what's going to happen is that um is that there'll be fee bidding you know i can do this for two percent you know the problem is that is that basically architecture at the moment is based on a, a certain percentage of the cost of buildings they're never going to be any more buildings because buildings are very expensive so all you have is this finite amount of money now if you reduce that five percent down to 2%, then you've got 40% of the income. And that means, frankly, that architecture is not a profession that you're going to make much money in, and architecture is going to go out of fashion, and we're going to get really weak people doing architecture. It used to be a prestigious thing, and now in China, everyone I tell them, they tell me it's, it's design. Kota Tzita says that it's design, that nobody wants to do architecture. And apparently in Xinhua, they're struggling to get students. It used to be very, very difficult to get into Xinhua. So my, my concern is there's going to be erosion of the role of the architect. I saw that we saw it also in Eastern Europe after 1989 in Romania, for example, everyone would do architecture. Then suddenly they realized, oh, I can make more money as a kind of financial officer or a kind of economist or a lawyer or whatever. So I think that's what's going to happen. A kind of like a, 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 the status of architecture is going to go down. And I think it is going to lead to a sort of a, a modernization, actually. Um, that's what ChatGPT said. So it's probably right. Yeah. Okay, that's the real last question. So I will not look at anyone else in the eyes. Looking questions. So Richard, it's all yours. Thank you. Neil, thank you very much for your lecture. Really, really eye opening. Um and want to ask a question and also poise a possible condition. Is it that AI is exposing the fragility of humanity? And 
in that fragility, is there any hope that we could use AI to guide us to a point where we could have a sustainable everything, everywhere, all at once? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 you know, I, I yeah. Um, I, I don't know, but I, you know, I think we, we have to be intelligent how we use AI, and for sure, it can give us incredible advice. And I just, I go back to Charles's lecture. I think that there was glimmers of something amazing there. You know, we we need to kind of, I think we need to sort of, I, maybe I'd make it one comment for 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 architects. You know, I think what we need to do as architects is not to design another building. We need to design the very future of our profession, and that means challenging all these preconceptions about what we have been about and trying to use these tools to, uh, to, to produce another condition in which we operate. So um, I'm kind of optimistic in the end, but um, I don't know the answer. But I will say one thing, if you, if there, there are no answers, but if you're aware of the problem, it becomes a different kind of problem. It becomes a problem that you can begin to address rather than one by which you are trapped. So, you know, I'm just pointing out there's a problem on the horizon there. And, uh, I, I I I get upset when all these architects think, oh no, no, there's no problem. There is, there is. And everyone in the world of computer science is telling us. So I think we need to pay attention. Thank you very much, Neil. So Neil Leach. Okay. This is the very end of the exact symposium. I just need to provide you with uh, a very few quick information. Give me a few seconds. Uh, let's go from here. I'm sure we are all quite tired by this day and a half. And uh, you can trust me that especially the team that has been behind the exact symposium over the last uh, eight months is also pretty tired. So I'll make it very short. Um, this was the first edition of the exact symposium. We really do hope to have the second, the third, the fourth edition. We are still planning when, and uh, there are thoughts about it. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you, of course, uh, Sean Jotan Liverpool University for the overall support and uh, for helping us making this happening, as well as the design school. And, uh, well, you know that this, this event has been created mostly from the Department of Architecture, but nice to see people from uh, Urban Planning and Design, Civil Engineering, Industrial Design, and even Taisan Campus, which have been with us today. And then you see three logos, one of which is a bit dark. I apologize for that. Uh, our friends from Caramba have been running workshop in parallel uh, with the with the parallel sessions, as well as future. Um, sorry, the same um, the digital futures. As I said, we are a bit tired. And uh, on that note, I will have to mention something later, as well as Robotic Plus from Shanghai, who have supported us too. A big big thank you for the, to the four keynote speakers, Charles today, together with Neil. Arturo and Florian, who have been providing us with a lot of insights about AI, fabrication, architecture, and uh, philosophical questions too, of course. So we've been uh, digging uh, across a huge number of topics and things. A big thank you to the authors and presenters, so not only those in uh, on site, to, uh, and I'm very happy actually that someone has been even uh, flying from uh, far away from Scotland, for example, to be here today. Uh, again, a big thank you to the Caramba team for the workshop. You can see a couple of pictures, things that were happening uh, in parallel in the design building. And I think Matthew got sick out of the, of the workshop. <laughs> oh, by the way, uh, the workshop was also attended by a few staff uh, of the department, which makes me pretty happy. A big, big thank you to this list of people, which is not comprehensive at all, starting from the chair of the scientific committee, which is now also dealing with uh, Zoom and recording, which is uh, Giancarlo Di Marco. A 
as well as all the colleagues that also have to with uh, paper review, uh, Asterios in Liverpool, Theo in uh, Antwerp, Henry in uh, HKUST, and all the others. And then moving to the organizing committee, which was uh, perfectly led by Mia, which is over there. But you're just waiting to get done with this and go for a beer because she's utterly exhausted. As I said, there are a number of people also uh, that I've not mentioned here, like uh, our technicians, our uh, professional service staff, uh, graphic design helpers, and so on and so forth. So I, I couldn't put all of them there, but really, really big thank you to these people. Um, for the academics and those people that look into age index and uh, stuff like that, uh, as soon as possible, we will submit all the material to Springer, uh, and the um, proceedings of this uh, symposium will be published into the lecture notes in civil engineering. So you will find that Grant has some time, and mostly Grant Springer, some time for the publication. And all the um, presented and published papers will be also indexed in Scopus. So you'll find that there, ASAP. Uh, you will find all the pictures of those day, this day and a half at that QR code or at that link. Yes, that's more of taking a picture, but we will circulate also further emails later on. Not, not the mail, we will not spam you, but there will be some other email about the publication and so on, and we will embed also this information over there. Of course, uh, there is there is no um, symposium with me that cannot have an NFT. Uh, so you will receive an email from Exarc later on and uh, if you are uh, a launcher or a member of scientific committee or presenter or other category you will find a link uh, connected to a non-fungible token an nft with a short guide i hope i can make it as short as possible for you how to mint it in the blockchain so you will have a unique record of this uh, of this event okay and last but not least uh, I wish I can see all of you in the next conference, which is arranged again by the Department of Architecture, which is called Architecture Cross Boundaries, AAB 2024, that will take place between 30th of August and 1st of September 2024 indeed. Call for paper is already closed. We are now going through the, rev the revision of the um, review of the papers. Also, those will be uh, published in uh, Springer. So, Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Ah, thanks. Thanks for uh, thanks, Giancarlo, but also me. Actually, she was looking at me. Um, the recording of this uh, symposium will be available in Digital Futures, probably next week, maybe in ten days. It's just a matter of dealing with uh, MP4, some uh, fine tuning, uploading, all those technical things that most likely very soon AI will do uh, on our behalf. <laughs> <laughs> At the moment, the AI is called Giancarlo Di Marco, Davide Lombardi, and Mia De Dio Saputo. Those are the three AIs doing this. And I. Huh? And I. And I, yes. 